missed Ruth's 60th home run. You may have missed DiMaggio's record 56th. But tonight, you can witness an historic, once-in-a-lifetime sports phenomenon. Mark McGuire goes for home run number 500, and Tony Gwynn goes for his career 3,000th hit. Both records will never again fall in the same ball field. Be a part of baseball history, for tonight, the road to Cooperstown once again meets us in St. Louis. banks of the Mississippi River. We welcome you to Bush Stadium in St. Louis, Missouri for Major League Baseball on Fox Sports Net. Tonight we hope to see history as Tony Gwynn's San Diego Padres battle Mark McGuire's St. Louis Cardinals. Tony Gwynn in batting practice just one hour ago to hit shy of 3,000 and he wants the record tonight in St. Louis and then go back to being just one of the guys. Mark McGuire is as big as the babe in this rabid baseball town. Big Mac is trying tonight to join the exclusive 500 home run club. Mac hit 499 last night. Tony had three hits. He is two away. Titles in 18 years. Incredible on base percentage and batting average that has taken Tony to 15 all star games. He can play defense too. But baseball will remember Gwynn because he can hit. Tonight he goes for 3,000. And his friend Mark McGuire has long admired Tony's skill. I sit there and I watch. And I, and I watch how he adjusts every pitch and every at bat. And it's something that uh, actually I started watching uh, back in 92 and started adapting to that. Um, when you're a young player, you don't really realize that you need to adjust during at bats and, and pitches. Uh, you think you can just. You know, basically, you try to see the ball and hit it, but there's things that go on with that. And um, Tony was the first guy in baseball that studied video. And he set the press, and it's now every team does it. So um, he's just he's one of the purest hitters in the game. And uh, he's the one last dying breed of start his career with one team, he's going to finish his career with one team. And I just love watching him play. Mark McGuire took hold of the baseball world last year when he shattered the single season home run record. Number 100 came in 1989 with the Oakland A's. 200 in 1992. Number 300 in 1996. Number 400 as a Cardinal last May. And now number 500 he hopes in St. Louis tonight. One of baseball's best hitters Larry Walker wishes he was here. Downtown St. Louis. A sold out crowd here at Bush Stadium 53,000 on hand for the final game of this series between the San Diego Padres and the St. Louis Cardinals. Let's check out Bruce Bochy's lineup. It is brought to you by Zima and he will lead things off with his second baseman Kilby Overas batting second of course the great Tony Gwynn with a grand slam last night. Reggie Sanders a two run home run last night. He has really been hot and so is Phil Nevin. Look at his slugging percentage. Wally Joyner bats fifth and Eric Goins. Ben Davis is the rookie catcher. Chris Gomez back healthy at shortstop and Andy Ashby the pitcher bats ninth. And they're running against a great big tall six foot six hundred ninety pound right hander Larry Lubbers. Spent a lot of time in the minor leagues. His fastball is not something that really pops your eyes, but he's learned how to pitch in and out. It's a fastball sinker type. Throws a slider. He's got to be very precise with his control. He uses a split finger as his changeup. But he's. And defensively behind him, he has Ray Lankford, J.D. Drew, and Willie McGee in the outfield. That's a lot of speed. Tatis is an excellent third baseman. Edgar Renteria, young shortstop. Craig Paquette just acquired from the New York Mets on Saturday. And Big Mac at first base, only six errors this year. He has won a gold glove in his past with the Oakland Athletics. Eli Marrero is very gifted defensive catcher, and he will catch Larry Lubbers tonight. Well the Cardinals and Padres meet for the final contest of a four game set tonight as St. Louis looks for its first four game sweep over Tony Gwynn and the Padres since July of 1990. Tony Gwynn's grand slam gave them the lead but it was short lived as Eli Marrero came up with the game winning hit in the eighth inning last night. 
And now stepping to the plate, he'll be Uberis. And he takes strike one. Steve was about to say earlier when we went to the defense, Larry Lubers needs the defense behind him. He is not a strikeout pitcher. He gets a lot of ground balls when he's right. So you're saying he has to really be on his command because if he elevates the baseball, we could be seeing San Diego hit a lot of home runs. Absolutely. And he really has to got to get this first hitter in Veras because he'll show a lot of fastballs if he's on base. And that's what Tony Gwynn would like. And you can see Kilvio Veras tries to go deep in the count. It's not that he's a great two strike hitter, but he tries to beat a prototype a prototypical leadoff hitter trying to work the pitcher deep in the count and trying to get on for the guys behind him. Down low. Now the count evens two balls and two strikes to 28 year old Kilvio Veras from the Dominican Republic. Veras pops it foul and will be out of play. Kilvia was acquired from the Florida Marlins in 1996 for Dustin Hermanson, who's now a starting pitcher with the Montreal Expos. Barris was wanted by San Diego for his speed. And at one time, he led the National League in stolen bases, but the stolen base percentage way down this year, and now he takes it low, three and two. Well, he's had leg problems. He was a top-notch prospect. When I was managing the Mets, our three best prospects were second basemen. Edgardo Alfonso was there now in New York. And Vina, who's with Milwaukee, and Veras as he fouls the ball back. They were all very talented young second basemen. But this is important for a leadoff hitter, especially with Tony Gwynn coming up next. If you can get on base, it makes the pitcher and the catcher now throw more fastballs. Fouled off, so they're making Luber's work. And Gwynn is standing in that on deck circle and he is watching every single pitch because he's never faced Larry Lubers. And this might be his gift to see as many pitches as he can see early in the game, even from the on deck circle. Boy, is that a good point? Yes. And that's what a leadoff hitter can do, too. You can see the whole arsenal. It is up high ball four, so Gwynn will come to the plate. Needing two for 3,000 in his great career, trying to become the 22nd member of the 3,000 hit club. Great ovation for Tony G. Pete Rose leads them all with 4,256. I was at that game in Cincinnati, and it was against San Diego and Eric Shaw. And here is Gwynn. And he sends one to left center field, where it will be corralled by J.D. Drew for the first out of the first inning. Well, notice he didn't wait around. He jumped the first pitch. That'll happen a lot of times with hitters who are not sure of what particular pitchers will do in situations. So they'll try to go after the first good pitch they see. Now, as you mentioned, Tony Gwynn is an unbelievable student of the game. So he had, I know he had watched films of what Luber's done before this season when he has just recently been up called up by the Cardinals. But he tried to jump the first fastball he saw. He hit it sharply in the left center alley, but that's the first out. And now Reggie Sanders comes to the plate. Barris always a threat to go, and now time called by Reggie. Sanders hit a home run last night, and he became the fifth member of the 2020 club in San Diego history. That's athletes with 20 home runs and 20 stolen bases. So Tony will take a seat. He was sitting with his son Anthony before the ball game, and Anthony was out with Ruben Rivera throwing the baseball, and then underneath hitting in the batting cage. And Anthony, his son, is quite a hitter, and Tony's very proud of him. But Tony had a great mom and dad when he was growing up in Long Beach, and he wants to do the same, give back. Well, he has given back plenty, and especially to baseball fans, just watching him play. Boy, he has been some, some player. Harris does not go, and there's a strike in the outside corner. Well, speaking of good players, Reggie Sanders, before he got banged up with Cincinnati, was an all-star. This guy can do it all. He's been more, can I say, more healthy this year than he has been in recent years, and you can see in his numbers what he's been doing. Sometimes a change of scene will help that as well. Pickoff play at first base. 
Barris always a threat to go. He has stolen 19 bases this year, but he has been caught 13 times. I mean, in his career, he used to have dramatic numbers in the other area where he would steal almost 80 percent of the time when he led the National League in plus 50 stolen bases with the Marlins. Sanders lifts it foul. McGuire reaches in and his arm just not long enough at six feet five inches tall and 37 inch sleeves. He has long arms to start with. They always worry about being near railings and dugouts of course earlier in the year Mo Vaughn fell down the dugout in the first game of the season. I'm sure you remember seeing that and it's affected him all year long. But what you try to do anytime there's a pop up near a railing like that you keep your eye on the railing try to go to the railing if you can and then lean over you don't want to hit it on the run because that's when you really get hurt. Sanders behind the count one ball two strikes. Barris does not go and the pitch taken two and two. You know you were talking about Kivio Barris not running as well. Well when you start getting nicked up he's had all sorts of leg problems ankle problems hamstring problems and it takes its toll a little bit. And Eli Marrero and the Cardinal catchers he and Castillo the other catcher throw exceptionally well you better get a good jump if you're going to run against the Cardinals. There is a lot of Larry Lubbers, so how quick to home plate is he to help out Marrero? Well, he changes. You see now he's got a very quick move to first base, and that has really helped him. You're right. When you have somebody who's 6'6", six, six, all legs and arms, it takes a little longer to get the ball to the plate, but he's a little quicker than you would think for a big guy. He does not go, and the ball bounces in the dirt. That was a good pitch to go on, as Lubbers apparently was going for the strikeout. Now the count's full three and two, and Kilby are likely going to go. You can see other ball clubs have tested him since he's come to the big leagues. This is only his fourth start. But if you're going to run, this is a good time to run right now. Three and two count. One out first inning. Barris goes. The pitch taken. It is ball four, and Barris. Just walks into second base. So a pair of walks to start this game, and Larry Lubbers, who has to have good control because he is hittable. I mean, here's a guy who, in his last game, went without a decision against Colorado last Saturday, allowing four runs on eight hits and five and two thirds. So he will give up a lot of base hits, usually 10 to 11 per nine innings. And there is his pitching coach, Dave Duncan, who did such a great job with Oakland, but just has not been able to have healthy pitching in St. Louis. Boy, that's so true. Dave is one of the best pitching coaches in the game and has been for quite a while. Barris goes, and there's Morero's throw. It is not in time. Sanders goes to second on the double steal. Well, it's very interesting that many good base runners feel that it's easy to steal second base. Now you can see Kilvio Veras gets a pretty good jump. He doesn't stay down. He kind of jumps up in the air. The throw by Marrero is almost there, but you can see Veras sliding head first is in there. Watch the throw. See him come up underneath the tag. The tag is missed on the arm and hits uh, Veras in the shoulder, but a lot of base runners feel it's easy to steal third. And here is Phil Nevin, and he just rolls it to third. Tatis up. His play is to first base. They get the out there, but coming home to score is Kelly Averis, and San Diego takes a 1 0 lead. Well, this is an exceptional play by Fernando Tatis. This is almost like a bunt. It's a swinging bunt. I didn't think he had a chance at Nevin. Tatis made a nice play. Some third baseman figure the only way they can make the play is to go to the plate if the runner is trying to score, but he has no chance here. Here's Veras. He sees this swinging bunt, and he doesn't mess around. He's taken off. And Tatis makes a great play. Look at this throw. When the ball rolled up towards third base, I thought Fernando had no chance. But Mike Geisler, who's the hitting coach, says he has grown so dramatically offensively to help his defense. And they never question his defense. There's a ground ball to second base that will end the inning. Paquette throws him out. Well, we have history in the making here in St. Louis. Tony Gwynn, 0 for 1 in his bid for 3,000, and Big Mac is coming up next. 
Foreman lined out to J.D. Drew in left center field. Now let's check out St. Louis's lineup, and they will lead things off with Mr. Drew, the center fielder, who's hitting 325 his last month. He'll be followed by Willie McGee and then Mark McGuire who has a home run in five of his last six games. Ray Lankford has more home runs at Bush Stadium than anybody else. Fernando Tatis will play third base. Then it is Edgar Renteria with 21 steals, the lead St. Louis. Craig Paquette, the new addition at second base. Eli Marrero bats eighth and Larry Lubbers will bat ninth. Andy Ashby at 32 years of age, 6'5", 200 pounds. You can see what he's got. Four seam fastballs, and when he gets up in the zone, he can touch 94 miles an hour. Two seam sinker, lower in velocity, but makes things happen. Gets a lot of ground balls. His curveball is a slur ball, a slur type. It's a big one. He's got a sharp little slider, and he uses a changeup and a split finger. Gets a lot of ground balls. Well, San Diego has not impressed many people this year defensively. Sanders, Owens, and Gwynn in the outfield, and Tony has won five gold gloves, but he is now in his 18th big league season and with a lot of injuries in his past. Phil Nevin in for Dave Maggin at third base and George Arias. Limited range there, limited range at short with Chris Gomez. Kilby Averis has speed at second. Wally Joyner is excellent first base. And the catcher is a rookie, Ben Davis, and this kid has all kinds of tools defensively. Well, here's J.D. Drew, the 23 year old outfielder from Valdosta, Georgia. Former Golden Spikes winner at Florida State and first round pick of St. Louis last year. Talk about two. You talk about talent. You mentioned about Ben Davis. He is really a sensational young catcher, 6'5, 215. J.D. Drew is going to be a superstar in this game. He struggled to get started this year with injuries and otherwise, where they fed him a steady diet of those off speed pitches. J.D. Drew has power, speed, he can throw, he's defensive, a good defensive player, and he can use the whole field. And Mike Eastler, the hitting coach of St. Louis, just raved about it. He said, here's a kid who's hitting 267, and really he has not even scratched the surface of what we are going to see. There's the great hitting instructor who was with Boston and was with Mo Vaughn for such a long time. Well, J.D. Drew swings and misses on that breaking ball from Andy Ashby, and there's Andy's first strikeout. Well, that's exactly what when we were talking earlier about the fact that J.D. Drew struggled to begin with the problem that he had he was seeing so many off speed pitches he's a good fastball hitter but Ashby's got all types of off speed pitches and he just saw one of them and speaking of a guy who's popular in this town you could hear the crowd warm up Willie McGee one of the nicest guys in the game out of Hercules California do you know where he started his career and what organization the Yankees. The Yankees gave him away, if you can believe that. And all he did was win a couple MVP awards. Batting title here in St. Louis. He was part of that rabbit team that had Vince Coleman and Tommy Herr and great Jack Clark, who was a slugger with Whitey Herzog, the skipper. Beat the Milwaukee Brewers one year for a world championship and lost to Kansas City in the cross state rivalry in 1985. Well, he's one of the few guys that got traded to another league. He was traded over to Oakland in 1990, Tony LaRusse's club. And he was hitting so well in the National League, had enough at bats that I think he won the batting title. Yep. And he wasn't even in the league at the time. He was with Oakland. Right. But Tony loved him so much, he wanted to come back because he said he is a great team guy, mm -hmm. very helpful to the younger players. McGee takes low. Ashby kind of swatches the dirt. He knows what he has to face next, so he does not want to allow McGee to get on. <laughs> that is an imposing man. We were talking about Hercules, California. How about Hercules, period? <laughs> Tap foul. You know, years ago when I was managing the White Sox and also coaching the Yankees, we would go into Oakland in the weight room for the Oakland ballpark was right behind the visiting clubhouse. I'd go in there and lift some weights, little weights. I'd go in there and Mark McGuire, look at those arms. He was lifting 65 to 75 pound dumbbells in each arm and just moving them. And when he didn't put them back on the rack and I wanted to go over and do something, I had to get a dolly to move them. <laughs> 
McGee did not go around. The count is full three and two. There's your third base umpire, Mark Wagner. Jeff Nelson is calling balls and strikes. Mark Hirschbeck at first base and Wally Bell at second. You know, I asked Mark McGuire, I said, how can you lift this heavy weight before a game? He said, this is how I get loose. That the is rest amazing. of us get tight that way. He gets loose. Oh. Ground ball second base. Kill the Obaris. McGee is out and listen to the ovation as Big Mac comes up in search of home run number 500. And everyone in this ballpark is standing and there is good reason. This guy has been so wonderful for baseball. Even stand the man himself standing. Boy, what a hitter this guy was. Look at his concentration. Well, you said that you were talking to Mike Easter before the game about Mark McGuire and how he focuses in on what he's doing as a hitter. His hitting coach believes he's as good as he's ever seen. Mark takes high, and every single camera went off at Bush Stadium. As the pitch was thrown to home plate, Mike Easter said he is the most fundamentally sound baseball player he has ever been around. His self discipline is absolutely amazing because during batting practice, there's thousands of people here and they're ooing and eyeing at every swing. And he has to be concentrated, focused to narrow that to the pitcher's pitch. There's a drive center field and deep and it is caught two feet from the center field wall by Eric Owens. So McGuire with a bid for 500 is turned back in his first at bat. How much is this one? I thought this was a pop up. I couldn't even find the ball when I looked out here and the ball just kept going and going. Look at Owens going back and back and back. Notice he never took his eye off the ball. It's very difficult to see at this time of night. Wow. I can't believe that ball went that far. I thought it was a pop up. And you know Mark McGuire wants to get it here in St. Louis because after they leave Bush Stadium they go on the road for a long time. But a base hit up the middle by Eric Owens to start the second inning off Larry Lubbers. Well, five time all star Gary Sheffield talks with Chris Myers about life on and off the field on going deep. That is Sunday at 9 o'clock on Fox Sports Net. The Dodgers have been one of the biggest disappointments in baseball this year, despite one of the highest payrolls they have been at near the cellar in that National League West. So Chris will dig in a little bit with Gary Sheffield. Here's Ben Davis. This is the young man you were talking about. He's only 22. He was a first round pick in 1995, the third overall, I'm sorry, second overall out of Malvern Prep. And for years, fans in San Diego were saying, hey, what about Ben Davis? And he was just, they were letting him take his time, single A, double A, triple A, and here he is in the big leagues at 22. This kid is talented. You might see them run here. Bruce Bochy has got to make some things happen. Their offense is not real potent. And Owens has 24 stolen bases this year. You know, earlier in the year, when about two weeks ago, the Padres won 14 in a row and got to within two of the league lead, of the division lead, I should say. Well, since then they've lost 11 out of 12. But when they, when I looked at them and I saw that their batting, team batting, was at the bottom of the league, I said, "How did they do this?" And they did a lot of little things. They ran a lot. Bruce was aggressive. They ran. They hit and ran. They took the extra base. They stole bases. They were second in the National League to Houston in stolen bases. So they tried to do a lot of little things. And at the time they said they were getting pretty good pitching and pretty good defense. And then I looked at their defense. Their defense was rated 14th in the league. I said, boy, they must have been lousy before. If they're getting better, that much better. There's a quick pickoff move to first base, which is almost a balk. Umpires, if they see a pitcher spin on a left heel, if it's a right-handed pitcher spin on his left heel, will sometimes, as you can see, Tony La Russa give the signs to Eli Marrero, will call a balk if they spin on that front heel. The runner goes the pitch gets away from Marrero and an easy steal of second base by Eric Owens. 
Well, this ball was in the dirt. And with Marrero knowing that the base runner is going, he tries to backhand the ball. Watch the pitch. It's in the dirt. So he tries to backhand the ball because he knows he has no chance of blocking and throwing the runner out. See, he tried to short hop it but couldn't get it. So San Diego's trying to get back to the creative ways that they really experienced great success in late June. Owens with his 25th steal, and that pitch is very wide. Ball one, ball, ball four, excuse me, to Ben Davis. So Davis goes to first base, and Luber's not starting the second well. And no, he's Tony not. LaRussa concerned. I mean, Luber's really shouldn't even be with the club. Tony LaRussa had Matt Morris, Alan Bennis, Donovan Osborne as starting pitchers, and all have been gone for the season. Boy, it's very difficult for any ball club. No club's deep enough to lose one of their real good starters, not to mention three of them. But Lubers was very effective in AAA. He's learned to pitch at the minor league level, but he cannot continue to pitch as wild as he is today and be successful. He was the top pitcher at Memphis with a record of 11 and 4. But I really thought St. Louis was what going to be one of the challengers in the Central this year. But when you lose those three pitchers, Morris, Bennis, and Osborne, that really is too much. Well, it is, and you've got to make do. And Dave Duncan has been like the mad scientist, trying to do whatever he can with whatever he's had to work with. See, even that pitch—that's an off-speed pitch. That was high. Those are the type of pitches you get hurt with. If you keep the balls down and you're missing in and out and down, you're all right. But if you're missing up in the strike zone and you don't have a real good burning fastball, you can really get clipped. Chris Gomez now at the plate. Lubers with the 1 1 pitch. Now that's that inside move, they call it. All they're doing is try to keep the base runners close because you don't know whether Bruce Bochy's going to pull something here. They're near the bottom of the order with the eighth place hitter. They might try a hit and run. So Tony LaRusso's clubs have always had the pitcher keep the runners close. And those signs are coming from Tony directly to the catcher. The catcher then gives that particular sign to the pitcher. The runners go and there's a hit and run base hit to right field in comes Eric Goins. Ben Davis goes all the way to third and right now San Diego is doing everything right in manufacturing runs. Well this is a heck of a, heck of a hit and run. This ball was down and away and Chris Gomez did a heck of a job. You know when you're asked to hit and run what you have to do is put the ball in play. The hit and run is is put on so that somebody is out of position. Now watch where this pitch is. You can see Chris Gomez. It's almost like a tennis player reaching way down and serving the ball in the right field into the spot at second base that was vacated by the second baseman Paul Kett who had to go over and cover second. San Diego takes a two nothing lead early but they led by three runs last night and wound up losing the game seven to six and here's Ashby who pops up. It is dropped by Lubers. He will throw out Andy, but they do advance the runner to second base. So Gomez goes to second. Davis has to hold at third base because he thought Larry was going to make the catch. Well, normally in a bunt like this, you like to see the ball bunted to the right side. You can see where he's he's got the bat in a good position. This is the way you want the head of the bat. But what happened he jabbed at it right at the land. See how he jabbed at it instead of trying to catch it. He was trying to put the ball along the first baseline. Nice effort by Lubers but he misses it. But he stays with it. He does, does not panic. He stays on it and he look how he grabbed the ball almost like a palm ball. He's lucky he didn't throw that ball away. So here's Kilby Overis. So Lubers has hurt himself in this game by walking three two in the first and here's Barris lining one sharply to left field the catch is made and Ben Davis has no chance. He was down the line about a third of the way and had to retrace his steps to get back to third so. This was a terrible base running mistake. This was a youngster making a mistake. The first thing a third base coach will tell a base runner at third base anything hit to the outfield come back and tag up. Ben Davis went two or three steps off the third base. He did not tag up and he was a he could not go back and then score. It is a terrible mistake that cost them a run. Well here comes Gwen two hit shy of three thousand and two hundred two of those hits have come against St. Louis and hundred two of those hits here at Bush Stadium. 
And he had five hits in one game here at Bush in 1993, his career best. With six hits, he did that against San Francisco, and he celebrated that anniversary 16 years ago last night. Came up with three hits last night, including a grand slam. And all the cameras are flashing because they want this history. They want to see Win get 3,000. They want to see Big Mac go deep for the 500th time. Tony is so selective a hitter. He uses a little bat, about a 33 inch bat, just a little over 30 ounces. It's really almost a little league bat. Stands close, to, relatively close to the plate, but with this little bat, he can wait till the very last second and then just flick at the ball, not come off it. With a crowd howling at Larry Lubers, they want him throwing a strike because they do not want him walking Tony Gwynn, who has the count three and zero. Oh. And he walks him on four pitches. I saw this one time in the past, Jeff. The Cincinnati Reds had the Montreal Expos in town, and Pete Rose was playing for Montreal. And Riverfront Stadium had printed out all of these certificates that said, I was there for Pete's 4,000 hit. And Frank Pastore was trying to throw strikes. He walks Rose three times, and the crowd is howling. He didn't get the uh, 4,000 at Riverfront, but he did break Ty Cobb's record there against the Padres. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were upset. Base is loaded. Now Reggie Sanders at the plate. So four walks by Larry Lubers, and his evening may be a short one. Here's Reggie Sanders. Well, I'm sure he got some sort of signal to be careful, or they prepared before the game. If the game were on the line, or it looked like a big inning could be had, he would rather pitch. He's more effective to right-handed hitters. He's vulnerable to left hand hitters. Well especially one that's two hits away from three thousand. So he was pitching carefully but his command is off. He's just not sharp. I don't necessarily think he was trying to walk him. But he was trying to pitch very carefully to him with an open base. Both these teams out of the race and the game is on baseball Thursday. The pitchers must be aggressive don't you think Jeff. Yeah you have to be <laughs> aggressive anytime especially with us in the ballpark here but you also have to think about what it takes to win a ball yes. game and if you have an open base and you're going to be careful with one of the greatest hitters that ever lived you got to make sure he hits your pitch and if you're not throwing strikes anyway and you're not throwing the ball where you want it it's going to look like you automatically just kind of unintentionally walked him. Sanders swings and fouls it back into the glove and now the count goes one ball and two strikes. Reggie walks stole the base his first time up San Diego with an early two nothing lead over the St. Louis Cardinals. Now when I say unintentionally I mean that's intentionally unintentionally or unintentionally intentionally whatever you say I agree with <laughs> or something like that <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> base is loaded against Larry Lubbers. Reggie breaks his bat loops it to short and Edgar Enteri is there. So just one run scores and San Diego leaves him loaded. St. Louis everybody's a fan of Mark McGuire and Tony Gwynn. Here's Jeff Bagwell on Big Mac. As far as Mark goes uh, I don't think anybody can look at him and say well I'd like to pattern myself. I'd love to pattern myself after that but uh, to be 6'5", 250 and hit balls when nobody hits him uh, I wish I could do that but uh, he's just been such a great thing for the game you know the 70 home runs he hit last year he's he's helped us with the game of baseball and that's the thing that I take take more than anything with. And Andy Ashby has seen Big Mac go deep against him already once this year and that is the one start he had against St. Louis gave up five runs in six innings. And Mac hit one 440 feet off Andy Ashby. We go to the bottom of the second inning. Ray Lankford will lead things off. And Ray takes strike one. Lankford has a four game hit streak going, seven for his last 13, to raise his average over the 300 mark, 301. And Ray rips that one in the alley, right center field. That will roll all the way to the wall. Lankford stops at second base with a lead off double. You know as you see Lankford drove this ball in the right center field. I was thinking about Bagwell. There's one of the classiest kids that ever played this game. 
And for him to make a comment about McGuire, obviously we're talking, as you see, this is a low fastball, and that's what Langford likes. This is supposed to be sinking. You can see the rotation on it didn't sink until it got out to one hop the wall. But Langford is an outstanding hitter. But when Bagwell speaks about McGuire with such awe, but what he's done for the game, that is really something. And baseball is so proud of these classy players. Yeah, I think a lot of people, even today, you open the newspaper, whether it's the USA Today or the LA Times, and Mark McGuire's name was mentioned about that uh, drug Andra, which is legal in Major League Baseball. It is not in the NFL and by the U.S. Olympic team. He quit it four months ago, really, I think, just to prove that, hey, I don't need this. Mm -hmm. It was just helping a workout. I agree with you. He just so highly thought of it, as is Tony. When you think about what McGuire and Sosa did last year and how great it was for the game and David Wells perfect game and the super Yankee team. Now here comes Cone pitching a perfect game this year. Here we have another home run uh, race in Major League Baseball with Sosa and McGuire again with Griffey not a long way behind them. And Fernando Tatis hits a base hit to left field Langford only can take third because he was not sure if Gomez would reach the baseball. So the tying runs are on with Edgar Renteria coming to the plate. For well, the Buick Open from Warwick Hills Golf and Country Club in Grand Blanc, Michigan is coming your way tomorrow at 1 o'clock on Fox Sports Net. Second round coverage begins at 1 o'clock. Billy Mayfire looks to repeat as the Buick Open champion. And recent winners have been B.J. Singh, Justin Letters, and Fred Couples. Brent Guyberg was 7 under today to take the early lead over five others, including Tom Kite. Here is Edgar Renteria. And you have speed at first base in Fernando Tatis, 16 steals. You know, you were talking about Mac and Gwyn, good citizens in the clubhouse, on the field, leaders, but also in their communities. And that's what we were talking about. Tony Gwynn, what he has given back, the hospitals that he has gone to, the money that he has given to his charitable organizations. The donation that Mark McGuire made to abuse children here in the St. Louis and national area and the work that he does for them in the offseason and he signs so many autographs for people he knows are going to be selling those balls at charities to raise money for good causes or for educational purposes in elementary schools. Ground ball third. They look for the double play they'll only get one and. Coming home to score is Ray Langford to make it two to one. San Diego. Fernando Tatis has been a good story. As you see him slide into second base, of course, this year he did something in Major League Baseball never done before. He hit two Grand Slam home runs in one inning against the Dodgers. So this game of baseball, they talk about this game. If you go to enough games or, or go to a game every night, chances are you'll see something you never saw before. Hey, if this happens tonight, what we're thinking possibly or what's possible to happen, nobody's ever seen before in this game. So this game of baseball is so special in, in that it's so unique. You never know what you're going to see in a given game. Now Craig Paquette. I mean, they've been playing baseball since 1869. And they had unbelievable offensive numbers in the late 1800. Certainly the 1920s when they when they Hurt pitching again, taking away the spitball, the shine ball, the Emery ball. Grab ball hit to third with the runner going. The only play they have is first base. It's in the dirt, but Wally Joyner is as good as any at scooping balls in the dirt, and he grabs it and head is out. Well, this is an interesting play. The base runner, Renteria, was running. So when Nevin got the ball, when he went way over in the hole, he realized that there was nobody covering third base, and he almost threw the ball away because he was aware that unless he got it over there, that Renteria might come to third. Well, just then, Chris Gomez came running over from shortstop to cover third base, but Nevin had already thrown the ball in the dirt, and a very good call by you, Steve. Wally Joyner has never won a gold glove, but he has the kind of glove that should have. A number of times. That's how good he is. His problem, he was in the same league as Keith Hernandez before he retired. And now Mark Grace, who's been fabulous, and JT Snow in the National League. 
when he was with Kansas City, JT won a couple of gold gloves with the Angels, and Joyner could not. And before that, Don Mattingly with the Yankees. Yep. So he is a terrific first baseman, and he really did make a nice play. Now Eli Marrero won the game last night with the game winning hit in the eighth inning. Marrero has been struggling this year. Last year, of course, they diagnosed him with cancer and he had to fight the cancer. He is a kid that they feel very, very sure of being an outstanding player before his career is over, but he's really been struggling this year. That is why LaRusse loves him. He is a real battler. He's only 25. Born in Cuba, then came to the States at a young age and went to Coral Gables High School in Miami, where he was then drafted by these St. Louis Cardinals in 93. So they'll intentionally pass Eli to get to the pitcher, Larry Lubers. And here comes Larry, who's as tall as Mark McGuire, but you notice a difference. <laughs> yeah, about 60 pounds difference. <laughs> He's he's tall and lean. How come there's no flash bulbs? <laughs> <laughs> well, wait till you see the swing and you'll know why. Okay. But I shouldn't say that. That's not fair, especially if anyone watched me hit. But when you think about the strategy in the in the National League, that's what you'll see. You don't want the the eighth place hitter, a regular hitter, driving in a run. So with two outs, he intentionally walked him. Well, there is one difference. You were supposed to hit. Larry is not. But you know the embarrassing thing. We had some pitchers on the teams I played with. Oh, Don Drysdale. Don Drysdale was hit. one. He could hit. Andy Messersmith could hit. And you could hit also. I've seen some old black and white highlights. <laughs> <laughs> they must have been at Rutgers. <laughs> oh. I'll tell you when Bobby Winkles, the manager of the Angels, told me the first year we went to the DH, he said, "You're going to be batting ninth this year." I said, "As long as I'm not batting tenth, that's all right with me." <laughs> Two outs, one and one count to Larry Lubers. Andy Ashby will be aggressive. And Andy goes high to spirit and throws out Larry, but St. Louis scores a run to cut the San Diego lead in half. Two runs in the first two innings. And with Tony Gwynn going for 3,000, so many fans. And here's some best wishes for another guy going for 3,000, Wade Boggs. Be waiting for you, and uh, I'm just glad we did it in the same year because our careers have really paralleled, and uh, and uh, we keep carrying that torch. And and uh, as long as you and I are around, then uh, we can sort of keep Mark and Sammy uh, on the back burner. Good luck. <laughs> uh, gateway to history. How about that? And Wade is playing with his Tampa Bay Devil Rays in Seattle tonight, making his bid for 3,000. Free shy. I don't think he's going to put Big Mac on the back burner here in St. Louis. Do you? Well, two singles hitters. That's what the joke was, I'm sure. And I don't think. And Wade said he's pulling for him, but he's pulling for him to come to 3,000 after he Wade Bar Boggs get there. You know these guys are competitors. You know Tony wants to get there before Wade. Wade wants to get there before Tony. Phil Nevin takes low. Phil Nevin has doubled his home run output. Joining Tony Gwynn hit seven home runs for the Angels last year 14 already this year. And there is a strike in the outside corner so. Phil Nevin won the Golden Spikes Award with Cal State Fullerton and the guy in center field J.D. Drew won the award with Florida State. Well sometimes it takes guys a little longer than others to make it and if you remember. When you think of Phil Nevin you think of a first round draft choice just as you do J.D. Drew but several years ago to the point was he was back and forth with Houston and they finally gave him an opportunity to play a little bit then he was traded to Detroit. He's a real tough guy. Chops it a third Fernando Tatis. One out. And as he grounds out the reason I say he's a real tough guy here's a guy that was willing to catch learn how to catch and catch at the major leagues just to get in the lineup. There aren't too many people who want to do that. They'll try to rest on the laurels and say hey I'm a third base and that's where I should be playing. He didn't feel that way. He also played some left field. And he still feels that he has a future behind the home plate catching. Remember Phil Nevin is not that old just 28. There's plenty of power. 
And here's Wally Joyner now. Missed 34 games this year because of an injury to his chest. And he sends this one to center field and J.D. Drew for the second out. You hear a lot of more now of, of chest injuries, you know, where the rib cage connects with the sternum and, and you oblique muscles in the uh, abdomen and underneath the, the rib cages and I think a lot of that has to do with weightlifting and I think guys take a lot of batting practice but if you're you, these guys lift weights so much and I'm not saying lifting weights is bad but sometimes I think that s some of them lift improperly and they strain themselves a little bit and then it's brought about by swinging or a, or a diving slide head first. And you'll talk to a lot of strength and conditioning coaches in the game who also say they don't stretch enough. Yes. Mark McGuire has had problems with his back in the past, but Mark says he has to go through a severe stretching exercise before and after every game. Barry Weinberg here does a marvelous job as their trainer. Of course, Barry was with Tony LaRussa and Dave Duncan and Mark McGuire and Dave McKay out with Oakland for many years. Prior to that, he was the Number two trainer with the Yankee organization. Trainers are so important. And you know, years ago there was no strength and conditioning coach with any ball club. In fact, weightlifting was taboo. But that now you take a look at players and, and they look like Popeye because they have been working so hard with the weights. Yeah, and I think as hitters it really helps. Chopper to third, Tatis. Well, he threw it a little wide. McGuire came off the bag. Catches the baseball and tags Owens going by. Lions, our sideline reporter, is one of the great hitters of all time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. They're, these are a couple of the greatest hitters of all time. Stan Musial and Lou Block. And, Brian, you guys know a little bit about hitting. You have 3,630 hits. Right now, what is Tony Gwynn going through? Well, Tony, yeah, I talked to him before the game, and uh, he came, he's a little nervous. Uh, Lou, when you uh, were going for 3,000, were you nervous? Well, I was here at home, so I, I was uh, in safe territory because uh, I needed two hits at 298, and the first two time up, I got base hit. But the second time up, Stan, I had no idea where I was. My knees were shaking and turned to jello, and everything was happening. You know, first time up for Mark McGuire, he hits the warning track ball. You had 475 career home runs. I got to think you hit a few to the track that didn't go out. You were so close to 500 yourself. Yeah, well, my first five years, I wasn't uh, trying to hit home runs. I hit a lot. I used to hit the ball left field, left center, and, and then try to pull the ball. So uh, I was 25 short, but uh, I, uh, I uh, wish I'd have got 500. I was a little surprised. It looked like they tried to hit and run in the first inning there with Tony Gwynn, and he got one of the guys that, with the best eyes in all of baseball, not letting him pick a pitch to hit, and, and uh, he ends up popping up to left field. Well, we uh, we were thinking the same thing, not that we second guessing the manager, but here's Tony Gwynn in a situation whereby a rookie out there he hadn't seen. You you thought that he would at least take a look at the pitch, but uh, they put the hit and run on right away, and perhaps maybe because he was a rookie and he hadn't seen him. What should this mean? It's certainly for Mark McGuire, 500 home runs is going to put him into the Hall of Fame. 3,000 hits. Tony Gwynn's going to waltz into the Hall of Fame. For two guys that know, describe that feeling. Well, of course, you know, to get 3,000 hits, that's a lot of hitting in uh, Texas. You know, you have to be lucky and don't, don't, don't get hurt for any period of time. And, of course, uh, Mark, Mark McGraw hitting 500, when you realize he's the first guy that's going to get 500 four years in a row. That's, that's a, he's a real home 50, run hitter. Yeah. 50 home runs, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. All right, guys, thank you very much. Enjoy the game. I know you're here. We're all here to see a little bit of piece of history. Good. Steve, let's send it back to you up in the booth. Thanks very much, Psycho. And... Lou Brock, the last National Leaguer to reach 3,000 hits. There's a tapper that Andy Ashby has, and he throws out J.D. Drew to start the bottom of the third inning. Lou Brock, number 20, Stan Musial, number six. I remember Joe Garagiola was the old catcher here in St. Louis, and an opponent asked him one time what was the best way to pitch to Stan Musial, and he said, walk him and then pick him off first. <laughs> Either that or they say to a good hitter, how do you pitch this guy? Very carefully. Mm -hmm. Well, here is Willie McGee, 40 years young. Very strong numbers against Andy Ashby and St. Louis Cardinals, and he lines out to Phil Nevin at third. So here comes Big Mac, gunning for 500. Mark came up with two outs in the first inning. 
and had a good swing on an Andy Ashby pitch and lifted it to straightaway center field and the ball just kept on carrying there's a drop center field and Eric Goins pulled it down two feet from the wall 400 feet away. Mark hit one four hundred eighty three feet he has been dead red lately 15 home runs in his last 20 games nine hits in his last 20 at bats and five of them have been home runs and once again the flash bulbs go on and I've got to think that's got to be distracting. I don't know if it is or not he is so focused I'm not sure he knows it's even happening I know what it does though not so much the flash bulbs but the situation as he swings and misses is that it affects the pitcher. The pitcher tries so hard. You see so many pitches that look like they almost hit McGuire. A lot of those are breaking balls that they're trying to throw so hard that it slips out of their hands or they're wrapping it. It can't pull it down. The pitcher doesn't want to be the guy that throws up a, a historic home run, so he's trying extra hard. Mack with a drive, deep center field. Historic swing, and there it goes. He hits it so far, he gets the fireworks going. He just missed one his first time up, and he went to the same area of the ballpark and hit it out. Mark comes out to take a bow. From Aaron to Ruth to Mays, Mark McGuire continues his chase of history. The fastest man to 500. And Stan Musial got to see history here tonight, watching Mark McGuire become the 16th major leaguer to hit 500 home runs. You know, it's amazing. He's only 35 years old. What will he do now? The pressure's off. What will he do the rest of his career if he continues to stay healthy? Yeah, 500 is automatic to the Hall of Fame. Absolutely. You talk about power. Look at those legs and that swing. Straight away center field. And the curtain call. You know this means so much to Mark McGuire who's not only a baseball player but a dad and he enjoyed so much the moment last year when his son Matt was here when he chased Roger Maris's record and his son Matt not with the ball club now he has other responsibilities at home in Southern California but he is watching this game on television and he loves his dad and Mark loves his son but Mark said the first year he played in the big leagues he played in the same team as Reggie Jackson and Reggie told him that he always regretted that he didn't have a child to watch him hit his 500th home run. Well, Matt had a chance to watch Dad eclipse Roger Maris last year and hit his 500th home run in 1999. Andy Ashby will remember you. You gave up number 500 to Big Mac.
McGuire just hit his 500th home run. Let's listen in as his hitting coach, Mike Eastler, is watching that pitch. Oh, yeah, there it is. Gone. It's gone. Gone on. He hit that one. There's no doubt about that one. There it is. Yeah. Way to go. That's why I told you. Try to curl whatever. And you know, that's what you love about the game the joy that your friends, your teammates have for the special moments in your life. You're not kidding. It's like going to battle. I know it's not life or death, but you live together and you compete together. And I'm up here in the booth. We got chills I up got, and down. I know the, the hair stood neck. up on my neck. That was just awesome. And what's been happening in baseball for somebody that just has enjoyed the game so much from the time I was a little kid, I just uh, almost get tears in my eyes when I see things like this happen. Great day at Bush Stadium and Mark McGuire has absolutely fallen in love with this city and they fell in love with him first and he said he was not set to go to St. Louis when he was traded from Oakland to the Cardinals. He wanted to stay in the American League but the town captured him. He has never seen a baseball market like this one. He's the fastest ever to 500. Jimmy Fox, Mickey Mantle, and Eddie Matthews never got to 550, and the fourth Harmon Killebrew stopped at 573. But the Babe was the second fastest. Then Harmon did his in 1971. The ball rides inside. Well, this guy just keeps breaking records one after another. And, and it's amazing when you see the size of this man and what he has been able to accomplish. You know, we were talking to Jerry Coleman. The voice of the Padres who played with the great Yankee teams of the 40s and 50s asking him about comparing McGuire and Gwynn to the greats that he played with or saw. In the air left center field J.D. Drew and Ray Langford usually the center fielder is the captain of the defense but J.D. so young and Langford makes the catch for the second out. And we were talking to Jerry Coleman. He says, I don't think I have ever seen a hitter hit balls farther during games, during batting practice, and otherwise than I've seen Mark McGuire do. He said, maybe the only guy close in hitting the balls for distance that he saw, and that included Mickey Mantle, was Frank Howard. But yeah. when you think about it, in 1965, there were only three players that weighed more than 230 pounds. Mark McGuire is six foot five, 250 pounds of pure muscle. And that's down 20 pounds from his days with the Oakland A's. And, you know, the, the size is one thing. You saw his forearms, you see the size of his legs, you see the size of the man. But it takes a lot more to be a great hitter. A line drive to the shortstop, and Craig Paquette is out. Just rhythmically, boom, boom, boom. He wanted to be on the field and I don't know if he knew he was doing it but it was working wonders with me. I went to kill him. <laughs> Andy Ashby now facing Fernando Tatis ground ball short Chris Gomez one out. Well, let's look at our Toyota active home run leaders Mark McGuire with 500 Jose Canseco with 428. We found out good news today about Jose he might come back in September that would be great story in baseball this year Barry Bonds with 427 he is healthy Cal Ripken on the DL and one away from 400 and what will be his Hall of Fame career and Ken Griffey Jr. that is the guy most people talk about when they talk about who can catch Henry Aaron 755. That's absolutely right he's not 30 years old yet and look where he is in that list and a tremendous talent and he doesn't even consider himself a home run hitter. Do you know what his link is to St. Louis? Ken Griffey Jr. is from Denora, Pennsylvania, and he's born on the same day as Stan the Man Usual, and Stan is from Denora, Pennsylvania also. So how does this all tie in together, this fraternity of baseball? Gosh, I don't know. Stan the Man. That's where Ken Sr. Mm -hmm. grew up, got where, married. Where was Arnold Palmer from? Wasn't he from the same area? I think it was the same area. Latrobe, okay. Fair to Midland athletes. Mm -hmm. Our producer Tom Hewitt, who is a great athlete in his own mind, 
is also from that <laughs> athletic Pennsylvania area. Here is Edgar Renteria. And Edgar chases a pitch in the dirt, picking it up Ben Davis. He'll lob it to first base, and there's the second out. Hey, it's always fun to listen to the last word. Jim Rome tells it like it is on the night line of sports talk shows tonight at midnight on Fox Sports Net. You can check your local listings. He always has the biggest names in sports, and he really asks people what they want to know. Jim Rome tonight, midnight on Fox Sports Net. Now I'm just sitting here thinking about this whole evening. Coming into this game I thought probably the home run would be the toughest one to get. I did too. I thought the two singles or two base hits might. There comes one back here. And if we caught it we were going to write 500 on it. <laughs> right. and we would sell it for a lot of money. Oh no that goes home <laughs> into a trophy case. Hey Eddie Murray got half a million for his 500 home run. I know. If I got one of those balls I don't sell it. I know what you're no. saying. Nope, I just couldn't. Well, I thought it was wonderful last year how many St. Louis fans caught 65, 66, and gave them back to Mark McGuire. And yes. he was so touched by that. And a couple of fans did the same with Sammy Sosa. Number 70 came here, a line drive screamer over the left field wall. Breaking ball. One ball and two strikes. To Craig Paquette. He's a great story, 30 years old. He was acquired from the New York Mets on Saturday, but earlier this month, actually in July, he played in the Pan Am Games representing the United States, one of their veterans, and won the silver medal. Well, they've had some good sluggers at this ballpark. And even before Bush Stadium was built 33 years ago, but Ray Lankford, not Mark McGuire or even Jack Clark, have more home runs at Bush than any other ball player. The switch hitter Ted Simmons had 81. <laughs> Look at that ratio, though 74 home runs in 159 games. That's incredible. Those numbers are just beyond belief. You know, he's done them, so you believe them now. But if you had ever, anyone had ever projected his, first of all, anybody projected before last year that he would break Roger Maris's record, you'd say, Oh, maybe 62, 70. Holy mackerel. What's next? That's right. What is next? You know, we were talking about home run hitters. We were talking about McGuire is the only hitter in history to have three consecutive years of 50 or more home runs 52, 58, and 70. Ken Griffey Jr. only missed by one three years ago. He had 49 and didn't play the last day of the season. Paquette pops it up. Jeff Torborg is racing back as it's well out of reach of Ben Davis. So Jeff leans out and misses it by about 40 feet. <laughs> well, we saw 500 tonight on a baseball Thursday on Fox Sports Net. We did feel the excitement here. But McGuire last year hit his 40th home run on his 281st at bat he hit number 40 on his 342nd at bat he now has 43 on the season Ashby meantime strikes out Craig Paquette to end the fourth inning it's Fox Sports Nets baseball Thursday here at Bush Stadium a sellout crowd of 53,000 on hand and Mark McGuire got some congratulations from an old friend Cincinnati Reds manager Jack McKeon here's what he had to say. Mark, uh, you worked hard. Uh, you got tremendous dedication. Uh, we're all rooting for you. You've done a lot for this game of baseball, uh, and uh, we're all tickled at that. When you reach the 500 mark, we're going to be there, even though we won't be there. We'll be there in spirit for you, and uh, our best to you in the future. Mark McGuire with his 500th. Jack McKean, Cincinnati Reds, competing in the National League Central for the championship with the Houston Astros. Cardinals started tonight 10 games behind. Well, here we go to the fifth inning, and Kilvia Varis will lead things off. He'll be followed by Tony Gwynn, who's trying to reach history in his own right tonight, going for 3,000 hits in marvelous career and all with one club these San Diego Padres Harris takes a strike on the inside corner right at the knees two balls one strike hey just think about how many possible at bats Tony might have left in this game all depending on the score and how many runs are scored fly ball left field Ray Lankford one out. 
win. The first time up, he went up to the very first pitch, a fastball. And J.D. Drew would make the catch. And then, with runners in second and third, they really pitched around him, and he walked on four pitches, and the crowd would boo. Hey, they love Tony here. And you love the moment when he hit the grand slam last night. There's a drive to center field. A long run for J.D. Drew. He gets there. 400 feet from home plate. And Tony is 0 for 2. Let's check out our Sherwin Williams trivia question. Off which pitcher has Tony Gwynn recorded the most career hits? You might be surprised. And it's not one of those, you know, you grab at the bottom of your ball cards and your duffel bag and you pull out and you go, I don't remember ever hearing of this guy. No, this is a guy who is a great pitcher. And Tony just, for some reason, has mastered him. Tony says he has more problems against rookies than he does against veterans. There's a line drive base hit to center field by Reggie Sanders. Why, Jeff? Well, first off, we'll tell you about going deep. It's five time All Star Gary Sheffield. He talks with Chris Myers about life on and off the field. That is Sunday at 9 o'clock on Fox Sports Net. Sheffield is among the league leaders in walks and among team leaders in batting average and hits. But he'll be also talking about those Dodgers that have struggled mightily this year. I'll answer your question about why sometimes real good hitters have trouble against people they don't know. It's because they're that good. As Sanders takes off. And he steals second easily and will go to third on the air. Well, they, they did not pay enough attention to him. That's not what the Cardinals normally do. The Cardinals right away will pay attention to guys who have a chance to go. But we'll take a look. You can see he's got a good lead. Whenever you're near the cut of the grass, that's a good lead. But he's got a good jump. He makes the crossover and he's got about four steps before the pitcher Lubers delivers the ball. And the throw from Marrero bounces and goes into center field. But what happened there, I think, he fell asleep a little bit with him not thinking he'd go on the first pitch. The left center field, and this could be trouble. Drew will not get there. Coming home to score, Reggie Sanders, and San Diego goes back in front at three to two. Well, we were talking about Phil Nevin, too. Phil Nevin's a guy that's taken a while to get to the big leagues. And stay here and be productive, especially after being a college star. But he's an aggressive guy. Here's the ball down in the zone. He reaches for it. See how he reaches for this ball, and he doesn't even release with his top handle late, and he hits it in the left center field alley. And even with J.D. Drew's speed, he can't get to that ball. It's perfectly placed in left center field. So San Diego, which had a 2 0 lead before the Cardinals came back. Scoring a run in the second inning and then tying the game on Mark McGuire's 500th home run of his career. Now Nevin breaks that 2 2 tie and San Diego's back in front. Joyner can add to that lead. Joyner is 0 for 2 in the game, grounding out and flying out. And he lines one sharply to right center field. They will send Phil Nevin. Here's the throw by Willie McGee, cut off by Big Mac. A run will score, but they have Joyner in the rundown and he is tagged out. But Wally does his job, giving San Diego a 4 2 lead in the fifth. Still two hits shy of 3,000 in his marvelous career. He is 0 for 2 in the game with a walk, but almost drove one out of the ballpark. Also robbed of a double. And now Eli Marrero grounds out to Andy Ashby. Well, Pete Rose. Has the most hits of any in the history of baseball. He talked about Tony Gwynn and what he would tell him. Well, first of all, I thank, uh, I thank Tony Gwynn for being the type of player that he's been. And the reason he's the best hitter in baseball today is because nobody works harder at it. And I tell him to slow down so he don't beat my record. <laughs> that is just like Pete. Tony had a chance to see Pete fly by his record back in 1985. And Pete was this week's guest on Hardcore Baseball. And Tony after he sets the mark will be a guest on next week's show on hardcore baseball it's a wonderful program with Kevin Kennedy and Steve Lyons he would tell him to slow down no question 
So we'll see a pinch hitter coming in for Larry Lubbers. And for the St. Louis Cardinals, that will be David Howard. Takes inside and low. Andy Ashby has given up just three hits in the game. A double by Lankford, a single by Tatis, and the solo shot by Mark McGuire. McGuire's 43rd this year and 500 in his career. You know, we've seen so many players. Who came from families where the father or the grandfather was a major league player? David Howard's the same way. Talked about the Griffies, the McCrays, the Boons, the Bells. David Howard's father, Bruce, was a pitcher in the White Sox with the White Sox and Baltimore in his career. I played against him when he went to Villanova, and they live in Sarasota. And David has, of course, started his career in Kansas City, and came over the Cardinals. Has had. All sorts of leg problems this year, and it's spent most of the time on the DL. A good player. He can really defend. Mm -hmm. Here's the 3 2. And it is high ball four. So David Howard works the walk. JD Drew will come to the plate representing the tying run. And remember, we had that Sherwin Williams trivia question, and the question was off which pitcher has Tony Gwynn recorded the most career hits? Very good right hander who's won a Cy Young. Greg Maddox has given Tony 35 hits in his past. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We talk about Hall of Famers. Greg Maddox, four Cy Young awards. Only one has more. Roger Clemens with five. First pitch by Andy Ashby to JD Drew is a curveball. Inside ball one. JD has struck out and grounded out. A very special player. We told you about the Golden Spikes Award. He won at Florida State back in 1998. He is the only player in NCAA Division I history to have 30 home runs and 30 steals in the same season. And McGuire had 32 home runs at USC, which the most which at that time set a Pac-10 record, which was later broken by now Angel Troy Gloss, who had 34. His last year at UCLA. You remember the guy that hit the most, I believe, of all time in college was Pete, Pete Incavilia, but that might have been, am I thinking career or am I thinking single season? That's my, career. That was career, okay. Because it goes Incavilia, Jeff Ledbetter, and Todd Green. Ah. It was a ground ball hit to short. Chris Gomez, nice play. Did they get the force? Yes, they do. This was a nice play. Chris Gomez just came back from having knee surgery on both legs. Nice play. Well, you can check it out on MasterCard. Be part of the All Century team. Just dial up www.foxsports.com and you can be part of the Fall Classic and visit and sit with the All Century team, the best players. In the 1900s, and here's one of them. Certainly, Mark McGuire. Willie McGee now steps to the plate with two outs. Big Mac hopes he has a chance this inning because he'd like to have a chance to tie the game up or give his club the lead. McGee has grounded out and lined out to third base, and Phil Nevin, Nevin robbed him of a base hit just before McGuire went deep. You're talking about that all-century team. I don't know how you could limit it to 100, 150 even. I mean, how they want to get down to 25 man roster. How do you do that? They're, first of all, you can't compare errors. And, and there are so many great players. How do you get down to that amount? That is beyond me. McGee fractured foul, and now he's behind the count, nothing in two. Now we talked about J.D. Drew. He was stealing on that pitch. It's interesting that for two clubs that throw over the first quite a bit and Andy Ashby has a quick move to the plate and has a pretty good pickoff move. Both clubs have run lately. It's it's as though with all the stuff going on in this game they've kind of lost the focus on the base runners. They have not thrown over and you know Tony La Russa's Oakland club with Dave Duncan and Tony are the best I've ever seen at different moves at holding a runner close. 
Well now Andy throws over but that's after Drew left. You know one of the things you want to do is make sure you put a thought in the base runner's mind right away as soon as he gets there. You don't want to let him think oh they're not thinking about me and off they go you know. Fastball rides away. One and two to Willie McGee. It's interesting to watch a young catcher like Ben Davis. He's only been in the big leagues for a few weeks. He's catching a veteran. And right there when the ball was up, he, he suggested to him, keep the ball down and relax. This kid's going to be a real good one. Well, you just watched the sign. If you had looked in and watched the sign that Ben Davis gave, when he didn't give a finger sign, one, two, three, or four, he gave a thumbs up sign. In the old days, that used to be a knockdown. We'd knock a hitter down. He gave the thumbs up. That meant to throw over. So that's the San Diego sign of what to do at first base. Let's see what he does here. Now that might be a pitch out. J.D. Drew does not go, and they do pitch out. That was my pitch out in Little League. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> that was the pitch out forever. And then people decided, well, you can see it. Great base runners like Maury Wills will get out there and see it as Bruce Bochy given the signs. So we had to give some other signs. We gave all ones as a pitch out. OK, now that's a pitch. Drew goes. The pitch is low. Throw to second base. Not in time. And J.D. has the steal his ninth this year. Well, not only did J.D. Drew have a good jump, but it was a breaking ball in the dirt. But Ben Davis with his great arm. Now here's J.D. Drew getting a good crossover and heading off to second. But this play is fairly close because of a great arm by Ben Davis. Remember that was a breaking ball, a good jump, and the ball was in the dirt, and this kid still made it relatively close. So Drew now at second base in scoring position as St. Louis down by two runs in the fifth. McGee has worked to count full three and two. McGuire on deck. This is a big pitch for Andy Ashby. Tapper to first. Joyner will take it himself, and St. Louis is done in the fifth. Missouri has seen history tonight. Mark McGuire hit his 500th career home run, and he joins an exclusive company of just 16 who have hit 500, and he did it on Baseball Thursdays. Fox Sports Net Game of the Week. It has been a wonderful year. It has been a wonderful last two years in baseball. And Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Tony Gwynn, three very big reasons why this game so popular once again. Big Mac captured baseball fans last year by shattering Roger Maris's all-time single-season home run record, hitting 70. And he hit at his 43rd this year tonight. Here's Juan Acevedo. Comes in for Larry Lubers. Acevedo has very good stuff. For a while, he was their closer last year. Then they were using him as a starter. He's got excellent stuff. His fastball is in the upper 90s. He's got a good curve, good slider, good changeup. He just has not been able to put it together the way he would like. Earlier in the year, when he was a very successful closer for them, he said he would rather start. Their question had been. Whether as a starter, whether his arm was hold up. He's had arm problems in the past, but he's a very talented pitcher, still trying to put it all together. And he's still 29 years old and has a good power body at 6'2, 228. Last appearance was Sunday against Colorado, threw two shutout innings and struck a man out. One will face Eric Owens, who's one for two in the ball game, and now hitting 296 in the year. And he's been a great story this year. 28 year old, really a reserve journeyman from Danville, Virginia. Bruce Bochy called him into his office in spring training and said, Eric, I like your work ethic. I think you're a really good player, and you've got a chance. And there is another infield hit for Eric Owens because of the speed. And he said, It was the first manager that has really shown faith in me. So Eric Owens a big leaguer this year with San Diego. Well the PGA Tour continues next tomorrow in the Grand Blanc Michigan. The Buick Open for Warwick Hills. Second round coverage will begin. Billy Mayfair won it last year. And the leaderboard looks like this. Brent Guyberger at minus seven. 
Tom Kite is with a group of five who are one behind Guy Burton. Now Ben Davis. The runner Aaron Eric Goins goes and he easily steals the base on Juan Acevedo and I say that because Marrero had no chance at all with the lead that Eric Goins got. Well, that's the second stolen base he's gotten and again that surprised me a little bit no throw over never no step off and that's not like the Cardinals. That is five stolen bases by San Diego in this game. And Davis does the right thing pulling the baseball and getting Owens to third. That's a very good point Steve when you tell your left handed hitters that if with a runner at second and none out if you can't pull the ball to the right side you don't feel like you can pull it to the right side of the infield bunt it to get him over there. But when you think of young Davis boy he has got some talent he's a big kid we mentioned he's 6 4 2 15 and he's a switch hitter. And he just hit a bullet and did exactly what was needed by this club. And the way St. Louis can score runs, particularly with Mark McGuire in the lineup, they, every single run is needed. San Diego had a three run lead last night and lost the game seven to six. The Cardinals came back. And a note to our viewers watching Fox Sports Net Bay Area and Nesson. We're glad to bring you this special game and want to assure you that after we take you to your home team's game and at the top of the hour that you will see every Tony Gwynn at bat live Tony Gwynn just two hits shy of 3000 and in this game he is 0 for 2. He could be batting in this sixth inning. We might see him in the seventh. Four away from Tony. He'd love to get it here because he doesn't want to continue flying his family all over the country. He's got to take him to Montreal next, and that's an expensive city. That ball is stroked well to left center field. J.D. Drew will make the catch, and San Diego manufacturing runs beautifully again. Coming home, Eric Owens with the fifth run for the Padres. Well, that's a good way to describe it. They did. They stole the run right here, got him over, and got him in. And that's what the San Diego Ball Club was doing earlier in the year when they won 14 straight. Now, remember, you got the number eight hitter up in Chris Gomez, and he's looking to get the ball to the outfield. And you see, it looks, and he gets the ball down. You can see he's getting lift in his swing. And it's almost like in his eyes that he's looking to get the ball up in the air, like he's trying to drive this to the outfield. So Gomez does his job driving in the fifth run. A single, a steal, a ground out, a sacrifice fly, and a run. So Andy Ashby has a three run lead to work with. And Andy has been tough with three run leads this year. And he lines one to right field for a base hit. Now that's something that Tony Gwynn needs is the more guys that get on, the more chance he's got to get up a couple of times more. Tony said he'd gladly accept it happening in Montreal but he had his brothers he'd like to get it done tonight. He wants to get his hits take his bows get it over with. He said he's not comfortable being the focus of the game. He just wants to go back to being one of the twenty five. Well this ball club has lost eleven out of twelve too after being so hot and they need some they need a win and that's what they got to go for right now. And that's why Tony I think in that at bat he took those four balls when he walked. He was not going to swing at a bad ball trying to do something individually. You know I saw a stat that I couldn't believe. The stat said that if Tony Gwynn for the rest of his career went 0 for a thousand he still would end up hitting over 300 for his career. Wow. 0 for a thousand. I don't know if that's possible. Does that sound possible? I read that somewhere. I don't think it's possible for him to go over a <laughs> thousand. <laughs> no, I mean that's telling a pretty good uh, career batting average with a few at bats to be up in that stratosphere. Where if that ever happened, of course that would never happen. But statistically playing with numbers.
We were talking about Juan Acevedo. He's a he's a power pitcher with break and stuff, but his fastball is straight. Throws it up in the strike zone, but he gets it up to mid 90s. He really has a good arm. Juan throws and Kilbio takes two balls, two strikes. Acevedo had to count his way, nothing and two to Barris, who was walked in the game, lined out, flied out. They tried to get him with an all speed pitch. That was either a split finger or a changeup. He'll probably come back at this point and try to throw him something straight and make him hit his way on. Oh, he just blows that fastball right by him. The inning ends. Ashby gets a hit, and as he goes by first base, watch what he does. Pat on the back to Mark McGuire. Way to take me deep. I'm in your history book. Third inning when he made history, hitting his 500th home run to deep center field, and watch the chase. Yeah, here it heads up in that grassy area, the backdrop in center field. Look at the folks going out there, and it overran the ball. One guy jumps down in the cement and comes up with it. What do you think about that? I think you're absolutely correct. Yeah. <laughs> How about that a standing ovation before Big Mac walked from the on deck circle where he was stretching to the plate and it seems like everybody in this ballpark is standing right now and you wonder if there are Mark McGuire distractions not only to the man himself number 25 at the plate but also his teammates and Tony La Russa absolutely says that helps the club it fires it up. He said the athlete that has gotten the most attention the last 10 or 15 years is Michael Jordan. What does he have? Six championship rings. He said having this much attention on the club means they should never have a flat day. I agree with him. I think when you have a crowd like this and the level of anticipation and excitement and electricity. McGuire pops a foul. It will be out of play and the count goes to one ball and one strike. How do you pitch to this guy? Well, there's one you pitch very carefully too. That's for sure. He prefers the ball down in the strike zone. He's more of a low ball hitter. He crushes off speed mistake pitches, and that's what he hit out of the ballpark. And he gets lift on almost every swing. Good fastball by Ashby. And you know he's such a different hitter now than when he was with Oakland. When I was managing the White Sox, he used to hang over the plate with his front elbow. We'd pound him inside, tried to stay away from down in the zone, try to get him up. But he's so much a better hitter now. Fastball up. Well, take a look at his hot zone. The only place they're getting him out now is away from him. You can see he's hitting the ball in. He's even hitting the ball through the top of the zone, even though he likes the ball down better. The 2 2. McGuire skies it in the air, center field. In comes Eric Owens. Out goes the second baseman, Kilby O'Barris, and he'll make the catch. So McGuire is out. Even the pop ups are monsters. So Andy Ashby with a five to two lead. Did you see Varus chasing that pop up. That thing was way up there. He didn't know where to go to get under that ball. May have been above the lights. And now Ray Langford who is double and grounded out. Made with a double in the second inning and scored the Cardinals' first run. Then Mark McGuire hit the solo blast. Well, you're talking about McGuire as a young hitter. I remember he, he talked about when he was young, he would just see the ball and hit the ball, and then you start piling up experience. You start talking with coaches, and it's almost like, oh, I understand now. Yes. Except if you remember he was a tremendous power hitter mm -hmm. as a kid and 49 home runs as a rookie in 87 right and then he had a stretch where he was hurt a lot and he was even having trouble seeing the ball one year he hit close to 200 I think that was either 90 or 91 and a lot of people wondered and I in fact he probably wondered what's wrong with me. But he has such self discipline. And I think he has taken something from every single hitting instructor he has had. Length 
Crawford rips one to right field for a base hit. This note to our viewers in a few moments. San Diego has a five to two lead over the St. Louis Cardinals in the sixth inning. You know, if you're watching where things have gone now with the Cardinals and with McGuire getting red hot, if you remember earlier in the year, if you came in to do a game or you saw the Cardinals, Tatis was leading the Cardinals in home runs and RBIs mm -hmm. earlier in the year, and you just knew that McGuire was going to be there by the end of the year. But the amazing thing, people were that early in the season saying, what's wrong with McGuire? You know, <laughs> last was last year an aberration. Well, there's no aberration, but it makes you wonder where can he go where can he go this year he's got he's got almost seven weeks left it is amazing what he might do again Sammy Sosa did not hit a home run today he went 0 for 4 in the Chicago Cubs game with the Montreal Expos Mark McGuire has hit his 43rd to take the lead and out comes Dave Smith to talk with Andy Ashby but that combination of McGuire and Fernando Tatis have more home runs than any combination in baseball. Fernando with 24, Mack now with 43, and that's 67 total. I mean, Sosa and Henry Rodriguez of the Cubs, five behind, and then Griffey and A Rod. And A Rod missed a month of the season with that knee injury. <laughs> and now they're in the new ballpark, and they're wondering how's the ball going to carry? It doesn't matter how it carries when those two guys hit. But Tatis, of course, came over in, I believe it was July of last year from Texas, and he has really developed as a young slugger. This kid has a lot of tools. And that Todd Stottlemyre trade right before the deadline. There's a fastball right at the letters, three and one. Now their feeling last year was when Texas traded him that they couldn't have won the division without getting Todd Zeal and, and Todd Stottlemyre. And Royce Clayton. The runner went. It was ball four, and we pause now so that Fox Sports Net Bay Area and Nesson can go to their home team's games. Viewers of those games will see each and every Tony Gwynn at bat. So Fernando Tatis at first base two on one out Andy Ashby now has the tying run of the plate and Edgar Renteria who has five home runs this year and Edgar takes up and in. Well you take a look at Renteria of course you remember the great big hit in the 97 World Series that beat the Indians has this kind of wrapping way of doing things with his bat a little like Gary Sheffield used to hit the ball when he was a little younger over the right. To right center field over the second baseman's head a lot. Seems to be pulling off the ball a little bit right now. Rounded to short. One and two. Andy Ashby with a five to two lead, keeping the ball down, getting out of trouble. With his best friend, the double play. Cardinals and Tony Gwynn also trying to make history as he makes his bid for 3,000 hits. He almost had two hits and two at bats tonight. First time up, line one to left center field, but JD Drew ran it down, and then he would walk in the second inning and come up in the fifth inning and almost hit it out. JD Drew went back to the wall and right at the base of the wall run it down. So here comes Tony against a new pitcher, Juan Acevedo, a new pitcher for Tony. First three at bats were against Larry Lubbers. Tony holding at 2,998. This is his 17th year over 300. 17 years over 300. And Cervato throws it a bit high, and it is 1 and 1. <laughs> Even the home fans are getting on their own pitchers. Now, both pitchers, when they don't pitch to him, that ball slipped out of his hand. 
You know, we talked about it before. You see the Gwynn family kind of smile at the fans' reaction. But we said before the same thing happened against McGuire. A chopper up the middle. And the second baseman will throw out Tony Gwynn. So he is 0 for 3 in the game as Craig Paquette throws out Tony. Left fielder, Reggie Sanders. We welcome our viewers of other games as the San Diego Padres have a 5 to 2 lead over the St. Louis Cardinals. Mark McGuire has hit his 500th home run. Acevedo now throwing to Reggie Sanders upstairs, ball one. Fastball pop foul. It'll be out of play. You know, just watching Reggie Sanders holding his hands. It's strange in the trade that he was involved in coming from Cincinnati to San Diego was Greg Vaughn. Now Greg Vaughn held his hands in front of his body. This is what started to hit him, the hit help him hit 50 home runs a year ago. Look where Reggie Sanders hands are right in front of his body and he takes them back slowly to hit. And Sanders sends that one to the shortstop Edgar Renteria. And guess who it was who taught Sanders to hold his hands that way, Mr. Gwynn. Well, FX Baseball Saturday Night continues with an American League showdown. Derek Jeter leads the world champion New York Yankees into safe goal field to take on Ken Griffey Jr. and the Seattle Mariners. Yankees versus Mariners, Saturday at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on FX. Well, the Yanks have the lead by six games for the Toronto. Boston is just a half game behind the Blue Jays for the wild card race in that American League. Here's Phil Nevin. Phil one for three in the game, drove in a run with a double in the fifth inning. Broke the 2 2 tie. And you were talking about the way Reggie was holding his hands. Yes. And Greg dropped him. It was Tony who came up to Greg one time when he had his elbow out. Yes. And he said, you know what? I could stand on your elbow. It is so firm. It is like a diving board out there. And he said, drop it down. And so, so Merv Rettman, I think, is one of the best hitting instructors of baseball. But sometimes you can get help from your superstars of the game, like Mr. Gwynn. Now, if you can't get help from those guys, you, there's a reason why they're so good. And a couple of the comments by people who are talking about it. in fact Pete Rose mentioned he works so hard he is a student of hitting a number of years ago I was asked to do a clinic with Tony Gwynn and Don Mattingly for the college coaches convention. And when I was first asked I said why are you asking me don't you remember how I hit or didn't hit and I said oh I never thought of this you want me to show how not to do it and they said no we just like you to narrate it. Well Tony was a little nervous then. that was back in the 80s a little nervous talking about hitting I said Tony you don't have to teach anybody about hitting just tell about how you do it. He and Don Mattingly talked for an hour and a half that you could have heard a pin drop. And you realize at that point the student of the game that he and Don Mattingly both were. But it's interesting Greg Vaughn hit 50 home runs last year and used to be vulnerable to the ball up in the strike zone. And if it was Tony that showed him how to do it, they held their hands in front of their body and slowly took it back, timing the ball and getting back ready to hit. Well, I see Reggie Sanders doing the same thing. Phil Nevin sends one to center field. J.D. Drew. And San Diego with a 5-2 lead as we head to the bottom of the seventh inning with a score 5-2 Padres. Let's take a look at what's coming your way tonight on deep. The Padres, though, have the 5-2 lead. Let's check out our Fram game summary. Big Mac with his 500th career home run in the third inning. Tony Gwynn is 0 for 3 with a walk. Eric Owens has scored 2 for San Diego. And Phil Nevin has driven into 5-2 Padres with the lead. San Diego started tonight 10 games behind Arizona. They've really been on a roller coaster ride this year. The Padres have gone from 13 and a half games behind in the American League West to two games behind to now 10 games behind. And Tony Gwynn said, "That's what happens when you have a young club." But remember, they had a similar roller coaster ride last year when they became the first team to go from first in their division in '96 to last in '97 to first in '98. 
Ball fly to right field. You know, watching Andy Ashby, he was a one of the mainstays on the pitching staff last year. He won 17 games. He was 17 and nine. Got off to a little bit of a slow start this year, but really has been doing a, a super job with Sterling Hitchcock. Both of them have been the front end of their pitching rotation. But remember, they lost Kevin Brown. And when you lose Kevin Brown, not only do you lose a big winner, you lose an attitude. You lose uh, the stopper in the front end of your order. You got Trevor Hoffman at the back end of your pitching staff. But you lose a, an attitude, kind of an aggressive attitude, a winning attitude. And I'll tell you, they lost something else. They lost Dave Stewart. And Dave Stewart was a pitching coach last year who is a winner. Second base, Kilby Overis. One out. So there are a lot of little things that make up a winning ball club, and one of them is a good coaching staff. And that's not to take anything away from Dave Smith. He had a very nice career, uh, most of his career with Houston as a relief pitcher. And Bruce Bochy has done a great job. And remember, they lost a lot of good players. I mean, Caminiti, a former MVP, Steve Finley. Uh, I'm probably missing about 15 others. They lost 50 home runs with Greg Vaughn. Carlos Hernandez hurt himself. Greg Vaughn with the 50 home runs. Joey Hamilton and Kevin Brown. But Dave Stewart taught Andy Ashby and Sterling Hitchcock that split finger. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock became a real winner in the National League. There's a ground ball hit by Eli Marrero. Yeah, just the little things. You see part of the bat, the ball players will say, go put that in a whirlpool, but I think that's beyond repair, that one. Andy Ashby is has been a good pitcher. He's the kind of guy you see him at the back of the mound right now. Last inning when Dave Smith came out, he almost looked like he was winded. Now he's trying, you see, he takes a deep breath. He's trying to make sure on this hot evening that he's ready to go. You can see him trying to work, wipe the perspiration off. Andy in the bottom of the seventh here. San Diego does have a very good bullpen. We will see a pinch hitter come to the plate. And that is Placido Polanco. Placido hitting 269 this year with 15 RBIs. Fouls it off. One ball and one strike. Yeah, you know, we were out here early today, and of course we saw Tony Gwynn taking extra batting practice after a three for four night last night with the Grand Slam home run. He's still taking early BP. But I watched Tony LaRusso work with a couple of his young hitters. Polanco was one, Marrero was one, Castillo was one, and also Joe McEwing who's not in the lineup tonight. And Tony was working with him. One ball and two strikes now to Polanco. What was the result? And well, they, I think Tony was just trying to build confidence and a little bit of bonding. And that's a good thing. A player likes to know that the manager's watching them even when they're taking their extra work. Ground ball short. Ashby with a 1 2 3 inning. He has pitched an outstanding game despite giving up the 500th home run to Mark McGuire. Tonight, here at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, Missouri, where we have seen history as Mark McGuire has slammed his 500th career home run. And Big Mac before a sellout crowd of 53,000 here at Bush Stadium. Wonderful baseball fans. He wanted to get it so badly here because the team then heads on the road to Pittsburgh and points beyond. And Big Mac wanted to give it to the hometown fans like he did last year when he broke Rogers record. A solo blast off Andy Ashby of 425 feet to straightaway center field with two outs in the third inning. That was the blast by Mark McGuire tonight. The new pitcher is Mike Moeller a left hander. This is his 31st game this year has an ERA just over five. He will face a lefty Wally Joyner then Eric Owens and then Ben Davis. I guess Mulder one of those guys that Tony La Russa has always felt comfortable with. He had him in Oakland and invited him here to St. Louis. Yeah he came up through the system. I'm sure Tony knew of him even when he was in the minor leagues. 
He just turned 31. Big guy, 6'2, 208, but left handers. Everybody's looking for left handers. And as you say, when you're comfortable with somebody, if you got a chance, bring them with you. Yes. I talked to Scott Radinsky today, who had pitched for me with the White Sox and was a teammate of Steve Lyons. And of course, it's quite a story. He battled cancer and then he made a recovery with the Dodgers. He had his elbow operated on this week and he showed me the elbow and he said you could not believe the stuff they took out of his elbow and he's feeling rare to go already with a big balloon of his elbow but left handed pitchers. My oldest son was a left handed pitcher in the minor leagues after pitching in the University of North Carolina. I told him if you could throw left hand and get a breaking ball over from to a left handed hitter you could stay in the big leagues for a lot of years and a lot of guys have done that. The one two by Mike Moeller and Joyner does not chase count evens two balls and two strikes and whatever happened to that left hander at North Carolina. Unfortunately he was having a nice career in the minor leagues his career his uh, contract had been purchased by the Do the uh, Yankees double A club and he blew his elbow out with oh. a Tommy John injury. Yeah. But he played on that ball club with uh, Walt Weiss B.J. Serhoff uh -huh. Scott Bankhead Matt Marullo that was a terrific North Carolina team. Here's Wally Joyner who played his college baseball at Brigham Young and he fouls it off left side. Count stays two balls and two strikes. Joyner certainly has been one of the leaders on this ball club through the years that he has been with them. Now 37 from Atlanta Georgia. His 14th year in the big leagues and Wally takes low and inside. My goodness when he came on in 1987. He hit 34 home runs and drove in 117 with the Angels. And really has not come close to those numbers since. But that was the 87 season when they really were talking about the ball being juiced. Well, that was true, and the ball was jumping out of Anaheim Stadium at that time too, with different configuration than it has right now. But Wally Joyner, they were calling it Wally's World. I remember when he was doing so well. Shortstop Edgar Renteria. Well, that was a terrific play. Renteria, pretty good size shortstop at 6 1. Surprised me a little bit when I looked at his numbers, and you could see his speed. His, his uh, knee is okay now. He had a knee surgery in the offseason, and he missed most of spring training and was not moving well, but obviously his knees are feeling good now. Boy, that was full out. So Edgar dings back in. And he gets Joyner out to start the eighth inning as St. Louis within three. They do not want to fall any farther behind with Andy Ashby pitching the way he is, and also with Trevor Hoffman waiting in the bullpen. Here's Eric Owens, who is two for three in the game, a pair of singles to center field, and he's also stolen two bases. Well, that's what the Cardinals have to do is keep this guy off the bases. Sends it to center field and J.D. Drew. Two outs. Catcher Ben Davis. This week on the Fox Saturday Baseball Game of the Week, we'll take you down to the field with Fox's sounds of the game when the Giants battle the Braves. Plus other regional action. It all starts at 12:30 Eastern and Pacific within the zone, followed by the E-Trade pregame show on your local Fox Television station. Steve Fiziak, Jeff Torborg here at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, Missouri. Cardinals down five to two, but Big Mac has gone deep, his 500th home run, and now the switch hitting catcher Ben Davis comes to the plate. And Ben, it's a ground ball, Fernando Tatis. Gets the Padres one, two, three. We go to the bottom of the eighth inning. Mark McGuire will bat again. A lot of good hitters out there, and he just makes, he just completely overshadows anybody else because he's just on another level as far as power and consistency. And to hit 70 home runs, he's got 40 already this year. He could very easily hit 60 again this year. So um, it's almost like anything he does anymore, you're really not surprised. Someone could say, well, he hit one completely out of Bush Stadium. And I go, yeah, really? Oh, that's interesting. And that act like it's no big deal because everything he does is just so incredible. And that would be something we would really be talking about. That would be impressive because this is a big ballpark. 
And Mark McGuire certainly has muscles and he has hit some monsters. His longest might have been the one he had in April of 97 at Jacobs Field off Arl Hershiser when he put a dent in the scoreboard. And a physics professor went out there and estimated it would have gone 530 feet. Now you remember the one he hit off Randy Johnson that was 98 going in and 104 <laughs> going out that was listed at 538 feet and they said if they did not have a roof on the kingdom it would have been completely out of the stadium. Mm. He will bat third in this inning. J.D. Drew first then Willie McGee and then Mark McGuire. Well I think Mike Piazza put it so well I mean there's a guy who has great offensive ability himself but nothing. McGuire does now surprises anybody. It's almost like it's expected to be the unexpected. J.D. Drew, a deep drive to left field, and running it down nicely is Reggie Sanders for the first out at the bottom of the eighth inning. The baseball Thursday has the Detroit Tigers and the Texas Rangers at seven o'clock Eastern, four Pacific. On Fox Sports Net, Tigers and Rangers next week on Baseball Thursday. How about that Rangers ball club, boy? They are they have been red hot. Everybody talking about the Mets being so red hot since the All-Star break. Texas is 17 and 3 since the break. And how about their catcher, Yvonne Rodriguez? 2020 man. Got 20 stolen bases and I believe 21 home runs now. He hit two the other night against Minnesota. And I keep on waiting for that humidity of Texas to wear Yvonne Rodriguez down. Here's Willie McGee and Reggie Sanders nails another. He can fly in the outfield. Well, listen to the crowd. They get started when this guy is starting to the plate. You talk about a buzz and electricity and a, a level of excitement that it's hard to describe unless you're involved in it. He hit number 500 with two outs in the third inning. A deep blast to straightaway center field, 425 feet. Andy Ashby goes right after him, strike one. Well, you know, it's amazing. People were talking. Now, take a look at this graphic. Mark is only one behind last year's pace. Is that incredible? <laughs> and Sammy, of course, at 66 is ahead of his. Uh, people are saying early in the year. Well, Mac has now hit 16 home runs in his last 21 games, and you were telling us that everybody was talking about Fernando Tatis being ahead of him. Yeah, that's right. That was early in the year. Everybody's a Cardinal fan, and I'll bet that young man has a McGuire jersey on because they're all red with McGuire 25 in the back. In there, two balls and two strikes. He wasn't too sure about that pitch. He couldn't hold up on the other breaking ball, but you see Andy Ashby is now trying breaking balls again. We heard Mike Eastler earlier say it was some sort of some sort of breaking ball that Big Mac hit. A drive. Another big memory for Big Mac. 501. Well, Mike Piazza said he belongs on another planet. He's put a couple balls into orbit. Believe me, that ball hit the scoreboard behind and over the bullpen, the visiting bullpen. What a rocket. This guy looks like he's playing in a little league field. Slow pitch softball. Watch this shot. Oh boy, up in the middle of the plate. After Andy Ashby delivered it, he ducked. Watch where this thing goes. It goes off that scoreboard. Unbelievable. That is well over 440 feet. And the scoreboard stops it. Dave McKay is first base coach, giving me a high five. St. Louis is the baseball capital of the world. It has been there the last couple of years. Andy Ashby now is taken out of the game. 
after he gave up a solo blast to Mark McGuire and St. Louis has closed to within two of the San Diego Padres. But McGuire with another titanic blast to deep left field. He is amazing. <laughs> and he has been fun to watch. 501 and counting. Next stop, the Babe here in St. Louis. Home runs. Take a deep breath and let it out. <laughs> you deserve it. But it's the distance they go. Rich Donnelly, who's the third base coach for Jim Leland in Colorado, he said they ought to give him more points for the distance. He said if he hits at the upper deck, give him three runs. If he hits an airplane, give him four runs. If if somebody says, I can't believe what I just saw, give him another run. There's a base hit up the middle by Ray Lankford, and that will bring the tying run for Nando Tatis to the plate here in the eighth inning. Hey, we've got to tell him about the new pitcher. Yeah, Trevor Hoffman, the magnificent closer the San Diego Ball Club is on. Remember this San Diego team has been struggling of late. They blew a six run lead a, a three run lead a six to three lead last night. And with all the electricity you said it earlier not a distraction to the Cardinals it can't be it's got to be electrifying almost like a prodding with all this excitement. Foul back. And how about can you imagine what the opposition feels like coming into this thing. You know, Andy Ashby's pitching a great ball game and. McGuire is whacked him for two. But you're right. When he hits the ball, they go so far. I know it only counts going over the fence, but my Lord, does he hit him a long way. Mike Easter said, when I saw him at Oakland, and Mike was the hitting instructor for the Boston Red Sox, he said, I remember he would hit long home runs, but he said, now when I watch him hit home runs, it's like the ball goes <laughs> when he hits it. It just <laughs> explodes. He says, it's not like anyone else in baseball. Well, how about the home run hitting contest up at Fenway. I mean he was hitting them out of sight into the night there was sometimes the ball disappeared when it went so far in that first round where you're going oh my goodness he he had 13 in the first round yeah and then his back tight now he sat there for a long time before he went out there again but he does that in the game I mean this is not it makes it look like batting practice I think let's say 15 years from now. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll be talking to Matt, the son's kids, tell him, I can't believe what I did when I was younger. He is hit two tonight, 500 and 501. Cardinal Dizzy Dean would say, they ain't a kid. The road to the hall leads through St. Louis. Hey, let's go down on the field to Steve Lyons. Steve, you know, I think the St. Louis fans have always known all year long, and since Mark McGuire has been here, never leave early if he has a chance to hit again. Sure, he hit his 500, but then he hit just a bullet for 501. You don't want to leave this game. You're also not going to want to leave because I'm going to catch up with Mark McGuire after the game. I can remember in my first major league start, my hands were shaking like that. It's the same feeling I have right now. Not only getting the chance to talk to him again, but just being a part of this entire telecast. It's been awesome. Back to you guys. And that is what is great being part of the Fox broadcast crew guys like Steve Lyons and Jeff Torborg the passion you have for the game and the absolute joy you have in seeing moments like this. Mark McGuire with number five hundred and five hundred one tonight. Tony Gwynn he's enjoying it as well. He'll likely break his record in Montreal. That's where the San Diego Padres head next. And Tony's covering up his face because he doesn't want to see his teammates see him laugh. He doesn't want Andy Ashby <laughs> to see him laugh. <laughs> he was talking to Reggie Sanders to his left. He is one of the classiest guys in the game. Manny Ibar is the new pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. The face Chris Gomez. Ground ball short, Edgar Renteria drops it. He was trying to one hand it. And it will be an error on Renteria. 
Well, coming up after the ball game, all the scores and highlights from the major leagues, and then of course we will have an exclusive Mark McGuire coverage from St. Louis, the Braves and the Pirates, and also Penny Hardaway's trade. Where did he go? I know the Suns wanted him badly. You can check it out on Fox Sports News after the ball game. What a night. It sure has fun, been fun to be a part of. You know, it doesn't matter how many years you've been in the game. That's what's so magnificent about this game for the fans. You can appreciate the game, you understand the game. It's it moves at a pace you can really appreciate the game. And you get to see one on one so much and facial expressions. It's just magnificent game. There's a ground ball base hit to left field. So the pinch hitter Ruben Rivera gets on. And now San Diego threatening again to try and break this game open. Gomez reaches on the air. Rivera now singles. Well, here is Kilby Overas. After the mound comes Tony LaRusso. He wants to quiet this uprising right here is St. Louis has cl closed within five to three two runs down and they still have the ninth inning to go with Renteria leading off the bottom of the ninth. Well now if you're Bruce Bochy this is a situation and you get the leadoff hitter up who bunts well you might put the bunt on but if the bunt works you get runners over then you got Tony Gwynn in the same situation as before with an open base at first base. But the Cardinals have got to set their defense, even though Tony might be coming up with an open base. They have got to set their defense right now to try to stop a bunt. And if San Diego is bunting, the idea for the best bunt with runners at first and second is toward third base. So we'll see. There are all sorts of defenses you can use. The basic one would be the pitcher getting over the third base line to field the ball but we'll see what Bruce Bochy puts on here. Bears right now is taking a strike and he showed no bunt at all. No he didn't sometimes you make it look like you were going to bunt and then see if you get a, a wild a swing at a, at a uh, kind of a cripple fastball but it, the bunt could be on a hit and run could be on Bruce Bochy now has a little cushion he still can do something unorthodox here. That's high. Well, it looks like he's going to let him hit away, but for part of the same reason we just talked about, it happened earlier in the game where Tony Gwynn hit with runners at second and third, and he didn't get a good pitch to hit. And if I were the Cardinals, even with all the emotion involved, I'd do the same thing because the main intent is to win this ball game. Checks his swing, rolls it to second. They tag the runner, and the ball. Busted free, so he is safe. A run will score, and everybody's safe. Well, this is one of those very close plays that if you run into an infielder fielding a ball, then it's interference. But in this case, Paquette already had the ball. Tony Gwynn we'd like to welcome those fans who have been joining us from other regions Tony Gwynn is still two hits shy of 3000 but Mark McGuire went deep twice and there is Gwynn to right field base hit number two thousand nine hundred ninety nine in his career and he knocks in two in the process and San Diego running away. Well, Steve, how about this? There's part of part of the family, but how about this fan, this fandom here in St. Louis? Their ball club's being beaten, and they give this man on the way to the Hall of Fame. Here it is. Here's the pitch in the middle of the plate. 
And Tony lines it down the right field line for a two run double. These fans are amazing here. So Boggs within one of joining 21 other great ball players who have 3,000 hits in their careers. Tony Gwynn with a double, 2,999 hits in his career. It has been a wonderful night here at Bush Stadium in St. Louis, Missouri. Tony Gwynn needed two for 3,000. Mark McGuire needed one for 500. Mack has bettered that by one, hitting two home runs tonight. And now a ground ball hit to third and two outs. I should say one out because of the two errors by the St. Louis Cardinals in this ninth inning. Tony may get it in Montreal and then maybe before a lesser crowd certainly than here in St. Louis. But I am sure the city of San Diego and their ballpark will throw him a great party when he gets home. Well some of Tony's family is smiling still because they get to go one more city. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a beautiful city in Montreal Canada. First, Tony Gwynn has a brother who was a former major leaguer and a very good one. Chris Gwynn had a nice major league career as well. Five ball right side. And I know we talk about this a lot, but you know he had good parents. Both he and Chris are just fabulous people. Yep. Very engaging. They always want to do well. They always have a smile on their face and something kind to say. So you know Chris and Tony had a great mom and dad who raised them in Long Beach and, and Tony talks about that a lot. Well he has talked so much about it. He talks also about his philosophy on life of treating other people the way he wanted to be treated. He's so accessible to anyone who asks for an autograph or an interview. Uh, he is really the consummate professional who is so popular. On top of that the guy probably is maybe as good a basketball player if you can believe that San Diego State he was a great point guard. You know he wanted to go to Cal State Fullerton but Augie Garrido only wanted him to play baseball and he said you can't do that. You know what he did in his last year at San Diego State on a Saturday he had 16 points and 16 assists on Sunday on the baseball field he went six for six. How about that for a weekend in the show coach Garrido that I can play both sports. <laughs> There's a line drive to center field. J.D. Drew will run it down. There is two outs now in the ninth inning. First Wonderful All memories here in St. Louis last year in 1998. And there's a second base umpire who has something wonderful to say. Wally Bell to Tony Gwynn. Mark McGuire broke Roger Maris's record by nine. 61 home runs in 1961. Big Mac went deep 70 times. He has 44 now, 44, and we are in early August. Fastball runs away from Manny Ibar. Well, I almost said well, Wally joined. I did say something to before about the pressure being off after getting the 500. There's always pressure. There's a pressure to do well given every day, but also he'll be in a home run contest through probably the rest of the year with Sammy Sosa. So the pressure will be there. But if you remember last year in New York when he got his 50th, it looked like it took the pressure off. Now he's got over 500. That'll take a certain amount of the pressure off. Bar steps off. Tony Gwynn goes back to second base. Tony's coming off a calf injury, no threat to go. Ibar was just not ready to come home to Wally Joyner. Tony Gwynn with a double, his 2,999th hit in his marvelous career. And they will intentionally pass Wally Joyner to face Eric Owens. Or Trevor Hoffman, I should say, because in the double switch, Ruben Rivera came in the game. 
I apologize for not announcing that. And that's why Rivera was the number two hitter in this ninth inning. And there's no way with an 8 3 lead they're taking out their best pitcher in Hoffman. He will hit for himself. But Trevor, remember, came up as an infielder in the minor leagues. He was a fine shortstop at the University of Arizona and a pitcher, and then broke in as an infielder. And they switched him over to the pitching spot because he had such a great arm. Of course, his brother Glenn was a interim manager for the Dodgers last year and a good shortstop in the Red Sox organization initially. Trevor takes high ball one. You know, it's amazing. We're talking about McGuire, and you start to look through their press guide, and there's got to be about 16 pages on the guy. He's just accomplished so much. It's like a novel reading about his career. How about this? Trevor Hoffman in the gap. He will score Tony Gwynn. Wally Joyner will head home. And he will score. And San Diego is running away with this ball game, leading 10 to 3. Tony's seen a lot of games like this this year with so many injuries to his pitching staff. Well, as you mentioned, we're talking now. We're talking about an outstanding hitter walking off here. But watch Trevor Hoffman, a pitcher who doesn't hit much. But look at this stroke. This is what you say. Look where his eyes are. This is what you say is a good hitting position. And here's a guy that is was signed as a shortstop, as you mentioned, Steve. And you know he probably pitchers pitchers love that. That's all they'll talk about for weeks. That remember that base hit or that double I got drove in two runs. That'll teach him to intentionally pass Wally Joyner to get to me. <laughs> well, Tony Gwynn gets the base hit a double, and he is now within one of three thousand. These are the best fans in baseball. Tony Gwynn went jogging out to his position in right field, and they just stood and roared. He took off his cap. And said thank you very much, and they raised the decibel level just a little bit more. Let's look at our Georgia Pacific play of the game, and we go back to the third inning. Big Mac coming to the plate. He is at 499 home runs, needs one to join 15 others with 500 major league home runs, and he does it. He hits two tonight as 500 and 501. Next up, Eddie Murray. Well, stay with us because right after the ball game, Steve Lyons will be talking with Mark McGuire. And of course, Fox Sports News will have all the highlights and scores with Major League Baseball and also coverage of the ceremony here at the ballpark as Bush Stadium and St. Louis pays tribute to their to their hero, Mark McGuire. What a night in St. Louis. Sellout crowd of 53,000. They may be disappointed in the score that shows San Diego 10 and St. Louis 3. Mark McGuire went deep twice. And that is a great memory enough. Now Trevor Hoffman will try and close the door, and he will get a save because when he came on, they had just a two run lead. Edgar Renteria will lead things off. Crowd all staying here for the ceremony and hoping that St. Louis can get a few guys on and have Big Mac bat again. Renteria behind the count, nothing in two. Mm, didn't miss by much. Well, the executive producers of Fox Sports Net are Arthur Smith and Bill Borson. The coordinating producer for Baseball Thursday is Larry Myers. Tonight's game was produced by Tom Hewitt and directed by Jeff Mitchell. Head of field operations is Andrea Jenkins. Fly ball right field. Tony Gwynn. He'll get a great ovation for that just because he's Tony Gwynn. Yeah, you know, I'm just thinking about the disappointment wishing that both milestones would have happened tonight, but maybe it's apropos. Our does not have to share that tonight. This is his park. This is his time. Tony was going to get it anyway. Well, not only that, but maybe it's important that Mark McGuire does not overshadow Tony Gwynn 
who likely will get it in the next couple of days in Montreal. Is that rationalization because we're disappointed? We'd have loved to have seen it here. <laughs> you know, we are absolutely <laughs> thrilled to watch Mark McGuire hit, too. You love yep. to be part of moments like these in sports history. Fastball runs inside. You know, it's so meaningful, too. You were talking about Mark and his son, Matt. Remember last year when he hit the record setting home run and he came across the plate and he grabbed his son up and hugged him? I mean, this country just. Just melded with that. I had three sons of my own. What a great thrill that must be. And you know, I remember what it was like when my boys played. So I remember what it must have been like for when I played for my dad. Now, can you imagine Mark being able to share that with his son, knowing that he's thrilled his son so much? It's fouled out of play. I remember where I was. I was doing an Angels game. And I had brought my daughter with me to the ballpark. She was up in the broadcast booth with me. And I turned to my daughter Ryan and, I, and we watched it together in between innings. He hit it. He was kind enough to hit it between innings. And I turned to her and I said, I'm glad you were with me for this moment. And we hugged each other. Craig Paquette takes inside. It is now three balls and two strikes. But that is what baseball is about a father, a son, or daughter bringing to the ballpark and not only talking baseball. For talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Time together. Yep. Like that. Right field, Gwyn at the warning track, two outs. I think you're right. You know, the emotion I had when they closed Old Comiskey in 1990, and afterwards we did a show. Tim Weigel, a sportscaster in Chicago. We sat in the same seat that his father took him to for the first game that he ever saw. And they were closing this ballpark. Before it was over, the two of us were in tears. Because I remembered my dad taking me to the old polo grounds in New York. And it made me think about my father and my sons. And that's what this game does. And we're still fans. I mean, after all these years, I've been in this game almost 40 years in either uniform or up in the booth at the major league level. I still get goosebumps and all excited about it. Well, Trevor Hoffman needs one out for a San Diego victory. But this night belongs to the big redhead from Pomona, California. The USC Trojan. And now a St. Louis Cardinal. Ground ball to short. The ball game is over, but the memories will continue as Mark McGuire hits two home runs, number 500, number 501 in his great career. Tony Gwynn, meantime, moves one hit away from his magic number, 3,000, with base hit number 2,999, a double that drove in two runs in the top of the ninth inning. But San Diego will win this game 10 to 3 over the St. Louis Cardinals. Andy Ashby gets the victory. Larry Lubbers takes the loss. And Trevor Hoffman saves his 27th game. But for Tony Gwynn, he easily could have gotten 3,000. The first inning, he came up and lined one in the alley in left center field. But J.D. Drew ran it down. He would later walk in the second inning and come up again in inning number five. And he would drive J.D. Drew to the deepest part of the ballpark, almost hit it out. But Drew would put it down. Seventh inning, a ground out. But the ninth inning would come up, and Tony would make the fans smile as he laced one down the right field side for a double and base hit number 2,999 in his career. So Tony Quinn will likely get his record in Montreal, where the San Diego Padres hit next. And the St. Louis Cardinals, they head to Pittsburgh. But they have given their fans great joy tonight, Jeff Torborg. I, I just sit here in awe, Steve. You know, we, we've seen a ball game, another ball game turn out to be a blowout at the end, 10 to 3. But we're talking about history. Is that amazing? Well, Mark McGuire, we can go all the way back to the 80s when he broke into this game. And he has just been a great representative of the game of baseball when he started out with the Oakland Athletics. And he hit 
home run number 100 back in the 1980s with the Oakland Athletics. And we've got some great highlights to show you of what he did in the early years. This was last year when he broke Roger Maris's record. But he got home run number 100 in 1989, number 200 in 1992 at the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, 396 with Oakland of Omar Oliveras, number 400 last May, number 500 came tonight. A third and inning solo blast to third inning. The eighth inning would come up and Mark McGuire would hit number 501 and this was a monster off the scoreboard. A salute to the crowd here at Bush Stadium and the fans Well, very few of them leaving because Mark McGuire will have a ceremony in this post game as he has gone past the 500 home run mark now he is chasing Eddie Murray who's in front of him with 504 and then after that it is the great New York Giant Melot. That is a scene we have seen so often in St. Louis the last couple of years. The Cardinals have not been a winning baseball team but they have that one first baseman who has been just given them great joy in the last two seasons. Well, having coached against him, managed against him, and just broadcast games that he's been involved in, to watch the evolution of Mark McGuire is amazing. You saw those first few home runs and how much leaner and thinner he was. He was a different type of player, a different type of hitter. 49 home runs in his rookie year. Then he slumped. He only hit nine in 93 and nine in 94, and still at age 35 has 501 home runs. That tells you what he's done around it. Amazing figures. Now we talked about what he has done the last three years. 52 home runs, 58 home runs, and 70. Here he is at 44. Hey, but Jeff, let's take a look at his two home runs from the center field camera. Well, you can see his eyes. You can see the intensity. His jaw is set, and every muscle in his body focused on hitting the ball. But this isn't just hit with the arms. This is hit with the legs, the entire body. You're talking about six foot five, 250 pounds of muscle and intensity. Look at this. So, you know, it's much more than just size. If that were the case, all these big professional football players would be big home run hitters. This guy has great strength and great hand eye coordination. And now they're waiting to. Hear from their hero, Mark McGuire. And Steve Lyons is waiting to talk to Big Mac. Could be coming out of that tunnel that leads to the St. Louis dugout. You can see Steve in the uh, background there. And here comes Mark McGuire. Steve Lyons trying to hook him up. Talk to him about the history he made tonight. He came in with 499 and hit a blast to dead center. Is number 3,000 for Tony Gwynn. And his first at bat of the night in a foreign country in Canada. And 24 hours later, Wade Boggs becomes number 23. And there 